Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Zhang. I'm a second year engineering science student at the University of Toronto. Today is December 17, 2021. And today I will be going over uh, Civ 102, Structures and Materials and Introduction to Engineering Design. So what exactly is Civ 102? Uh, it's a year one fall course uh, that is mandatory in the engineering science program at U of T. I took it last year during fall 2020. Um, and in, at that time, the head instructor was Professor Michael P. Collins and the head TA was Alan Guan. So the main course topics uh, that we focused on were stress, strain, deformation, um, specifically uh, relating to material properties, statics, as well as truss analysis, uh, beams and flexural stresses. So that would be doing beam analysis using shear force diagrams and bending moment diagrams, uh, moment area theorems, thin walled box girders, uh, as well as reinforced concrete behavior. And today I'll be doing um, a little recap of one of the quizzes that I did in fall 2020. And uh, in fact, it was quiz eight and it's called flexural stresses. And I took this uh, quiz on November 4th, 2020. It was uh, over BB Collaborate. So it was an online quiz because at the time uh, the entire term was online. Uh, so some of the quiz topics that this quiz covered uh, include calculating cross-sectional properties of a beam, such as the centroidal axis, as well as the moment of inertia, also known as the second moment of area, uh, using the parallel axis theorem. Um, also tested us on drawing shear force diagrams, bending moment diagrams for uh, loading configuration, as well as calculating the flexural stresses and the factors of safety. So this is the quiz in its entirety. Uh, there are four parts to it. Uh, first of all, we need to calculate cross-sectional properties. Second, as I mentioned, draw the SFD and the BMD given the loading configuration. Uh, the third part is calculating the tensile and compressive stresses on the maximum of both and where they occur in the beam. And finally, we need to calculate the factors of safety and how the beam would fail if we increase the loads uh, proportionally. So to begin with question one, all we need for this part is the beam's cross section, which I've shown on the right. And you can think of the location of the centroidal axis of this cross section as being like a weighted average of uh, the individual components of the cross section. So I've labeled uh, in red um, the two uh, rectangles that I've split the cross section into. So we have rectangle one and rectangle two. And what we should notice is that um, the centroidal axis of each of these rectangles is pretty easy to find because of the symmetry of the rectangle uh, about its mid height. Um, the centroidal axis is simply the mid height. And if we set our arbitrary reference to be uh, y equals zero at the bottom of the cross section, we find that the centroidal axis of rectangle one is at 165 millimeters and 20 millimeters for the other rectangle. Uh, so I've labeled these as y bar one and y bar two. And furthermore, to find the centroid, we need the areas of the rectangles. Since we're given uh, the dimensions, they're quite easy to find, just 40 millimeters by 250 millimeters. Uh, doing the calculation, we find that the centroidal axis of the whole cross section is at 92.5 millimeters above uh, the bottom face. Next, we need to use parallel axis theorem in order to find the second moment of area. Uh, essentially, what the parallel axis theorem states that we can find the second moment of area by summing the local second moments of area for each of our uh, rectangles plus an additional term. Um, which is equal to the area of the rectangle multiplied the distance squared between its local centroidal axis and the global centroidal axis. So we can calculate 
the local second moment of area of a rectangle by multiplying uh, the base times the height cubed and uh, divide it by 12. So we do that for both of the rectangles and notice how the base and the heights uh, are swapped between the two because they have the same dimensions just in different orientations. We can find D um, because we know the location of the global centroidal axis as well as the local centroidal axes for the rectangles. Uh, we'll find that they're the same in magnitude. And we already know the area of each rectangle from uh, the previous part. And so we can do the calculation and we find that uh, the second moment of area for this entire cross section is approximately 160 times 10 to the 6 millimeters to the 4. And we already got the centroidal axis from the first part. So now we can move on to question two, which asks us to draw the shear force diagram and the bending moment diagram. But in order to do that, we need to first solve for uh, these reaction forces that happen at uh, the pin and the roller. So I've labeled the reaction force at the pin uh, as X and the reaction force at uh, Y uh, or at the roller, sorry, to be Y. Um, notice I don't care about horizontal forces. Uh, because there's no applied force uh, horizontally. And first of all, to solve for the reaction force Y, we can use the fact that the moments about this pin should be equal to zero. And the reason for that is because this is a static beam. So we know that one moment is produced by this load of 50 kilonewtons. Uh, one moment uh, in the opposite direction is created by uh, this reaction force and a third moment is caused by this point load of 60 kilonewtons. And uh, doing the summation we, and solving for y, we find that y is equal to 97 kilonewtons. Then we can use the fact that the beam is not accelerating up or down um, to do a force balance in the y direction uh, in order to solve for the reaction force x, and we find that x is 13 kilonewtons. So now we can draw our shear force diagram. We recall that there was a reaction force of 13 kilonewtons uh, at this leftmost edge of the beam. And then we had a point load of 50 kilonewtons, which creates a total shear force of minus 37 kilonewtons. And then finally, a reaction force of 97 kilonewtons from uh, the roller and another point load of 60 kilonewtons. So it balances out uh, to zero at the ends. And recall that a bending moment diagram uh, has a property where the slope of the bending moment diagram at any point will be equal to the value of the shear force diagram at that same point. Which means that because we have these uh, three regions uh, of constant shear force, we will have three regions of constant slope in our bending moment diagram. And in particular, uh, what we can do is we can find these areas where the bending moment is maxima maximized by calculating the area under the shear force diagram. So by calculating the area of this rectangle, we find that this local maximum in the bending moment is equal to 32.5 kilonewton meters. And similarly, by taking uh, the area under uh, this block in the shear force diagram, we find that this local maximum for the bending moment is 60 kilonewton meters, or I should say uh, local minimum. So now that we have our diagrams figured out, we can begin looking for the maximum tensile and compressive stresses as well as where they occur. So if you'll recall from the bending moment diagram, we had two local optimum, one where we had 32.5 kilonewton meters of bending moment and another one with 60. So we can use Navier's equation to find the stresses experienced by the beam. And we have to be careful because we have two optimum, we need to consider uh, both of these as potential cases for maximum stress values. So when we want to find the maximum tensile stress, we should recall that when we have a positive bending moment, the tensile stress will be experienced on the bottom face of the beam. So this Y value will be equal to 92.5 millimeters because if you recall, 
the centroidal axis was 92.5 millimeters above the bottom face. Whereas in this local optimum, we'll find that y is equal to the height of the cross section minus uh, the location of the centroidal axis, because this is measuring the distance between the centroidal axis and the top face. Because when we have a negative moment, um, the maximum tensile stress will be experienced on the top face. So we can clearly see that uh, this second term is much larger, which means that the maximum tensile stress will occur at uh, this point, uh, one meter uh, from the right edge of the beam, and it will be occurring on the top face, and it will have a value of approximately 74.8 megapascals. We can do the same sort of analysis uh, for the compressive stress, but just flipping the side of the beam we're looking at. So when we have a positive bending moment, the maximum compressive stress will happen at the top face as indicated by this 290 minus 92.5 millimeters. And when we have a negative bending moment, the maximum compressive stress will happen at the bottom face. And so it's not as clear which of these terms is greater, but carrying out the calculations will show us that uh, this first term is actually bigger, which means that the maximum compressive stress will happen 2.5 meters from the left edge. It'll have a value of approximately 40.5 megapascals, and it'll be on the top face of the beam. And I've summarized uh, the locations for these maximum stresses uh, in this image. So finally, for the last part of this quiz, we need to find the factors of safety against ultimate failure for tension and compression, as well as how the beam would fail if we increase the loads uh, while keeping them proportional to each other. So looking at our course notes, uh, Appendix A of Common Material Properties tells us that for oak, the ultimate tensile strength is 90 megapascals and the ultimate compressive stress is 60 megapascals. Now, the truth is, uh, wood can be more complicated than this, uh, but we're just going to take these uh, for face value. So calculating our factor of safety is just dividing our ultimate stress by the maximum stress experienced by the beam. Uh, so our FOS for tension is approximately 1.204, and for compression, it's 1.481. Given that the factor of safety for tension is less than that for compression, we know that the beam would fail in tension first if the loads were increased while remaining proportional to each other, meaning the beam would snap on its top face at the right roller, and that's how it would fail first. So thanks so much for, uh, for tuning in, and I just wanted to make some quick acknowledgements before ending the video. Um, Thanks so much to Alan Kwan and Professor Michael Collins for uh, preparing course notes as well as uh, the content on this quiz. I'd also like to thank Alan, uh, Professor Collins, and my TA Jordan Caret uh, for their great instruction during this course. And I wanted to thank M. Kastner and H.C. De Silva for uh, this Beamer template. So thank you so much. and. Um, Looking forward to talking uh, about more courses in the future.